Um, we have uh, Magdalene Madibela from Human Women. We also have the Honorary Consul of Sweden to Botswana, uh, Kent Nilsson. And we also have the Ambassador of the EU Delegation to Botswana, Mr. John Sade. I hope I passed that. And we also recognize the presence of organizational heads, um, organizational representatives, um, media practitioners, and also um, all invited guests. Uh, before I dive into the welcome remarks, thank you so much for gracing this event. And uh, for those who will be coming in as the program progresses, we'll try and make sure that we recognize their presence. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Enjoy the show. All right, thanks so much, uh, Ms. Raniru Utlamete. And without wasting time, let's move on to welcome remarks from my Philemon Meso from uh, Husbo Mau President. Let's give him a round of applause. Thumbs up to the mic. Thank you, Gale uh, Boha, uh, invited guests, members of the media. I am the representing Botswana Media and Work, Botswana, <laughs> uh, Botswana Media and Allied Workers Union, that is BOMAU, uh, uh, is a union for, for media workers in this country. It was launched in 2016 by the then Vice President Mukwezi Masisi, who is then, who is right now is the President of the Republic of Botswana. Uh, the project that is being launched today is very important to us as the media workers in this country. It will actually help us to appreciate the role of men uh, or the role of fathers that are playing in in Botswana and actually raising their kids. We have seen some of the uh, the fathers taking the, the role, the responsibility of taking their kids to the clinic, something that in the past was for, for mothers. So we are welcoming you today on this event, and feel free, and you are welcome to discuss any issues with us as the media workers, and as well as those, the organizers of the event. Okay, that was really short to the point. <laughs> All right, next up we have, uh, thanks so much, Mr. Mesa from uh, Bomau. And let's welcome Mr. Desmond Luka from Men and Boys Gender for Equality uh, to give us the project overview. Thank you very much, uh, DJ Gouverneur. It's uh, Men and Boys for Gender Equality. Yeah, that's what I said. So I'm going to use this podium, <laughs> if it's okay with you. Um, I see there's another podium here, but everybody has been using this one. So uh, I might as well. Um, my name is Desmond Lunga. Uh, I'm a father of three, husband to Drifina, uh, and I'm a man and an activist that believes that we can be able to change as men. Not all men are, I don't want to say dogs, I don't want to say animals, but then they are good men and we need to celebrate those good men. <laughs> so I'm here to give you a uh, background of the program, uh, the Swedish Dads and Botswana Fathers. Um, we uh, in Botswana started this work five years ago through uh, the Men Engage uh, Network and through Sonke Gender Justice uh, Network. Our colleague from Sonke uh, have flight delayed. Um, she'll probably be joining us later. Um, they uh, started this work with us through a global co uh, campaign that is called Men Care, which um, seeks, seeks to get men in, engaged through pregnancy, during pregnancy, in the delivery room, and uh, taking care of their kids. So when we started this program in Botswana, it was um, quite a challenge, because like you all know, our traditional, our cultural practices do not allow men to be in the delivery room or um, uh, 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 take care of the child just after uh, delivery. There is usually a three months period that we call Vuteti, which is usually an elderly woman taking care of um, the, 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 the mother and the baby for those three months. So we had to go 
back into our communities and uh, start these conversations and say, can you please tell us why men are not allowed to be part of the delivery and uh, the, 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 the care work when taking care of the child for the first three months. And usually in Situana, they say, give me la, you just don't need to know. So you're never given a reason why. And so we challenged and said, but we, we want to encourage men to be in the delivery room. We want to encourage men to be part of the delivery. So we would need answers. So we were guided to the elderly women in Muchudi who we sat down with and asked them, please let us know. And so what they said to us finally after uh, harassing them, <laughs> they then said um, the reason why men are not allowed to be in the delivery room is one, they did that because they wanted to make sure that uh, this child spacing, so the three months would ensure that um, you wouldn't have sex with your partner. And therefore, if you would have another child, the child would be born the next year, so you'll be able to space your children and not have same kids in the same year. They talked about the immune system of the child. Um, as men, men were hunters and gatherers, and they would go out there, and so they would come back maybe with some infection that they might infect the kids. So that's why they were kept away from the kids during that time. And they also talked about um, the bonding of the child and the umbilical cord and the fact that um, there were spiritual beliefs that if the father had to have sex with anybody else but the mother, the child would be somehow affected and maybe the child can become a Down syndrome or something like that. And we realized that there was so much rich information and the biggest challenge was that um, we never got to share why such things are done. So in the Sitwana culture, there is a lot of rich information, but I think the main thing is to break it down. And so we then explained to them that we want these men to be part of the upbringing of their kids because one research has shown that men that are part of the delivery process um, are less likely to use violence and they're actually there for their kids and they help with their bringing of the kids. And we ask them to say, if we can allow these men to be part of this, we would ensure that we uh, educate them around family planning, which is a method that they can use. Uh, we educate them about hygiene, which would mean that they won't be able to affect the kids because they know they need to take care of themselves. We would also educate them and encourage them not to have multi-concurrent partners. And so when they say yes, we then started allowing um, training men to become part of the men care program and we started to see men being in the delivery room. And hence the exhibition today, Botswana Fathers and Swedish Dads. The main thing is that we want to encourage men to be part of the caregiving work within the home because we've realized that a lot of women still live in poverty because they are forced to take care of their kids they are not able to go and get an education, they're not able to go to work. And so it's important for us as men to own up and say we also want to be part of the upbringing of our kids. We also want to uh, bond with our kids. We also want to do the care work within the families because that way um, it will give equal opportunities for women and it also is good for the upbringing of the child where the child gets to bond with the father and get a positive male role model. So in, in a nutshell, I hope I'm, I didn't go on and on. In a nutshell, uh, that's the objective. We want to showcase fathers playing these roles, encourage younger men to be um, part of their pregnancies because we, we know a lot of young men, once the girlfriend says she's pregnant, that's the last time they, they see each other. So we want to say to them, it's okay, you can be a father, you can be a caregiver. And of course, to also advocate for uh, parental leave so that we can be able to see men taking time out and being part of their bringing of their kids. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoy uh, the rest of the evening. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much, Mr. Duke from uh, Men and Boys for, for, for the credit. All right, now. Uh,
Up next, uh, let's welcome from uh, the Swedish ambassador, uh, Cecilia Julian, to come and give us an address. Let's give her a round of applause. Thank you very much, Mr. DJ. Dumelang, that's about my <laughs> ability. Uh, good evening, uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, but I think maybe even better, fathers and mothers that are here, and children of fathers and mothers that are here. Welcome uh, to this event. It's, it's a big occasion uh, for us, uh, and I look forward to later on hearing your comments to the joint uh, exhibition. But I'd also like to start uh, by saying thank you primarily to, to Desmond and his team and men and boys for gender equality for fantastic cooperation. Uh, I think it's been tolling on you a little bit. It's not easy to have two partners on the other side of the border. Uh, but also uh, a great thank you to Sonke Gender Justice, which is our uh, South African partner uh, in this uh, Project. And thank you also to the entertainment, uh, great entertainment, and I hope they are all proud and engaged fathers, or will be proud and engaged fathers uh, in the future. So listen carefully to what's said here this evening. Uh, well, as you know, I come and represent uh, the world's first feminist government. Uh, since 2014, we've had a feminist government in Sweden, um, and with the sort of focus uh, or the aim, uh, the purpose of having a feminist government is really to create equal opportunities for men and women to realize their dreams and, and uh, frame their future. Um, well, I will say a few words about Swedish parental leave. And I realize that we're at an extreme if we compare to Botswana. Uh, but I hope it can be an inspiration. It's not a thing that you will achieve from one year to the other, but uh, look upon it as an inspiration. Uh, Sweden has had what we call, we changed from maternity leave to parental leave in 1974, just to make the issue clear that this is not a mother issue, it's actually a parent issue. We have today one of the most generous parental leaves in, in the world, I think. Uh, you get 480 days uh, paid for by the state. Not 100% all the time, but it's a long period. Um, and 90 out of these days have to be taken by the father or the mother. So neither of them can claim the full 480 days. Um, and there's an ongoing discussion. Should this have to be divided equally? Should we sort of should it be six months out of it that needs to be taken by by either party? Um, and, and well, that's a vibrant uh, discussion. Um, but I think it's an important that it's now natural to share part of it, uh, and I will come back to that experience. Um, but I think, uh, and Desmond mentioned a little bit the fact that the fathers share much more uh, inclusively in the upbringing of the children brings a lot of advantages. And I think if I can just quote a few things from the World Fathers Report made by Men Care in 2017. Um, and I think, well, first, it, it's not only enriching for the fathers. It's also very good, of course, for the mothers that you can share the labor. But most importantly, it's been shown that the children benefit tremendously from, from having a father. Um, it has shown that it uh, links to a higher cognitive development and better school results. Um, improved mental health, especially in the boys, to have a father engaged in it. Um, and lower rates of delinquency in boys. Um, this is something that we maybe didn't need to do surveys about. It's, it's quite natural, but I think it's important that science shows that there are um, effects. Well, it's also good for the maternal health uh, to have a father present and maybe also have him present in the delivery room. Um, and to have an involved fatherhood actually also allows the, the mothers and the girls to realize all their goals and ambitions uh, in the world. Um, and I think 
most important is that if you have your father present as a role model and you see him sharing the labor with the mother, that's an important signal to your children because as a lot of us, children don't do as they're told. They do as they are inspired and, and, and what they see. So I think that's um, an important part. And not least, to have the fathers and men more involved in the whole family life and, and the upbringing of the children has enormous economic benefits. Not least that the women can also seriously join the labor market where various studies show that that's good for the economy uh, as a total, to have a better equal participation in the labor market. But I think most important, this whole debate should not be sort of about forcing fathers to take their responsibility and, and it's actually, I think it should be framed as we have to give the fathers the possibility, the opportunity, the right to participate um, in, in the family life and in the upbringing of their own children. They have the right to know their children more intimately. And Swedish dads are now joined with Botswana fathers. Um, came about uh, by a Swedish photographer, Johan Bevermann. Johan Bevermann, he he took paternity leave uh, a number of years ago uh, and felt a bit lonely. He didn't see a lot of colleagues in, on the playground and, and things. Uh, so he started this project where he contacted fathers that had taken at least six months paternity leave and he sort of interviewed them and photographed them to create sort of inspiration for other part fathers that there are others around and there are great benefits uh, in taking uh, the opportunity to have your part of the paternity leave. And I think this about having role models to see other fathers doing it is tremendously important. Um, we have, and I think it was, that was for the first time that the cabinet minister in Sweden took paternity leave. Uh, was the 19, no, early 1990s, I think. Uh, and now more recently, our Minister of Education took six months uh, paternity leave. And that sends a very important signal that no one cannot be substituted for a while. Uh, so all, everyone in society, if I may tell a secret, your present EU ambassador here took up his post from one year of paternity leave. So, and still he became the EU ambassador. <laughs> So, um, before I end, I just wanted to share with you, uh, we had a colleague in the embassy, we have a colleague in the embassy, um, he's a South African citizen, but he recently took four months paternity leave. Uh, and I think when he started, it was his first child, a daughter, it was with a certain sense of trepidation that he entered and took over from his wife, who then went back to her work for a while. Uh, but I'd just like to sort of read, he wrote us a few lines about his experience of this, which I think is very telling. So I quote him. The hardest part of this experience was the isolation and the misunderstanding from other people. Some of our friends who have had children around the same time as us did not have the luxury of the father staying home for this extent of time. And as such, I was not able to share my experience with them, but they were as supportive as they could be and mentioned that they would love to have the same opportunity. Often I think that the biggest change that happens, that happened during this time as father, my relationship and perception towards my daughter has changed immensely. We could easily have sent her to a school or to a daycare center and she would easily have adapted to that situation as well. But having this time with her has not only allowed me to understand her, but also allowed for my appreciation for her to grow. Overall, being involved in each other's lives and knowing that we can completely trust each other to do what is needed as a family, we have grown incredibly close. So I think with that as an inspiration, um, I think we should all work in Botswana, in Africa, continue in Sweden, to give fathers and men the right to really be an integral part of their children's upbringing. Thank you very much for being here.
Well, thank you so much, and I think uh, we're good to go now. Thanks so much, man. Thanks so much, Ms. Lott. And uh, now let's just take a musical break of the entertainment by Kim Tindera. Uh, Kim Tindera, are you ready? I think we can just take that musical break when you come back and continue with the program. When you look at the program there, it says uh, after Kim Tindera should be the keynote speaker. Now, the problem is having a DJs and MCs, we used to mixing. So I know your program says after Kim Tindera is the keynote speaker. So as a DJ, I love what I do. So we're going to jump there. We're going to jump there and uh, go to the panel discussion. Then after the panel discussion, that's when we do uh, go back to uh, the keynote speaker. All right, DJ, let's get to you. Kim Tindera to give us this one.
Introducing our panelists for today. Um, we have Me Angelina Pino. 
she is not yet here, but she will be here. She will be joining us um, as we proceed. Um, Magdalene Madibela, gender specialist, you and women. A round of applause. Re Desmond Lunga from Men and Boys. And then we have Re Ronald Mbaka from Linkukame Foundation. Um, I, I'm, I've just been told now that um, Ms. Cecilia Chunin will be representing the panelist who is not here. Um, so we welcome you. <laughs> Our panelists today are going to be discussing the importance of fatherhood in raising a child. Uh, from t from uh, Since we started our program, we have been highlighting some of the progress that have been made in other countries in, term of, in terms of um, gender equality. And today, here with my four panelists, they are going to be looking at why it is important for fathers to be present in the lives of their children as they grow up. Um, to start off our, our discussion, um, I will start with Red Desmond Lunga to start us off. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I think it's important for uh, fathers to be involved in the upbringing of their kids because from uh, conception, men and women come together from their child. And so it should be our responsibility to be there from the beginning. Um, unfortunately, by nature, women are the ones that get to carry the child. But the least that we can do as men is to support them through that process. And as we support them through that process, we can also be able to bond with the child. And by bonding uh, with the child, already we are starting to create that relationship with the child. And so it's important for us to be there, first of all, to support the mother and support the child. And the de delivery room, a lot of Batwana are always afraid of this delivery room. Um, I've been to all my deliveries. Um, I've got three kids. The first delivery, I cried. I cried because she was in pain and there was nothing I could do. But I was there to support. And when the baby came, the bond, the feeling, it, it changed my life. It changed the view uh, that I have for my wife because it, it made me respect her more. Um, it made me bond with my child. And so I think it's important for every man to be able to experience that. Because if men are kept away, then they're not able to connect, they're not able to uh, go through the process and witness it. Uh, so you just know that the child is bought. You know, like Mr. Tuana, they'll tell you a child is bought. So you do not know the pain and, 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 and the, the stress that your wife has to go through. So that's, and then now when we talk about the upbringing of a child, whether it's a girl child, whether it's a boy child, the man needs to be there to teach them how a man loves a woman. I always say this, uh, I always say my daughter is going to learn how a man is supposed to treat a woman by seeing how I am treating my wife. And already that is a lesson. My son is going to learn how to treat a woman by seeing how I am treating my wife. So that role is important as a man to be able to educate, to be able to groom and, 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 and grow that child into whether female or a, a, male, a, 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 a man or a woman who is going to be responsible in the future. So I think I'll, I'll, I'll stop there for now. Um, thank you very much, uh, facilitator. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Magdalene Madibela is my name from UN Women. From the outset, I'd like to say that fatherhood is a gender issue. Gender equality is a critical measure for development. 
effective parenting and effective fatherhood will surely lead all of us to achieving the UN Sustainable Development Goal number five. And why do I center this conversation around goal number five and gender equality? Simply because fatherhood requires equal involvement, equal participation, and equal contribution to the upbringing and to the development of a child. Effective fatherhood requires equal participation in domestic work, in care work, and in the welfare of the home as a whole. So that is why I want to emphasize that fatherhood is a gender issue that should be taken seriously. Because if it is not taken seriously, we will be faced with the issue of gender inequalities that continue to be an obstacle for sustainable development, not only in Botswana, but globally. Goal number five specifically speaks of the different targets. 5.1, 5.2, 5.3. 5.1 speaks of removing discrimination for gender equality. Removal of discrimination from the laws, from the policies, and from the, from the programs. And where does the fatherhood issue come in there? I think we all have a responsibility from where we sit to be able to say, what contribution can we make to ensure that there's an enabling environment to deal with the laws and the policies that do not facilitate effective parenting? She talked about paternal leave earlier on. In Botswana, as we know, that conversation is still very difficult and we are yet to realize a paternal leave as law in this country. I'll recall uh, one very interesting uh, process that I participated in when I was still with SADC. We were developing the SADC protocol on gender and development. And one of the recommendations in that protocol was for member states to commit to removing discriminatory laws and ensure that paternal leave are you know, integrated and enacted into the laws. Lo and behold, most member states were very angry. They said, hey, what? hey don't bring modern ideas into this, into this document. This document is for Southern African member states. And it was very, very difficult. It was a very difficult conversation. And I remember, I remember, I remember one of the journalists here in Botswana calling me one very early morning. I was just about to, to go to work saying, hey, Mama Diva, did you just say that uh, paternal leave is a reality for Botswana? Are you sure? Uh, I'm told that it's one of the reasons why this protocol was not approved in Zambia the first time around. Uh, do you think paternity leave is, is reality? So this is a conversation, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that we all have to engage upon and learn from countries such as Sweden and see that effective and equal parenting is something that actually takes us to another level in terms of development. So enabling environment in as far as changing the laws, changing the policies, and really facilitating and enabling a more a, an effective parenting, and in particular, better fatherhood is very important. When you talk of gender-based violence, uh, which is a goal 5.2, that target cannot be realized if we don't have effective fatherhood. If men are absent, if fathers are not there, if fathers are not supportive, if fathers are abusive, they, first of all, as Desmond said, teach the, the, their boy children to be abusive. And second of all, if they are absent from their homes, uh, that's emotional abuse. So gender-based violence cannot be eliminated if we don't have good fatherhood and effective parenting. The list goes on and on. As I said earlier on, there is no way that we can achieve gender equality if only women are responsible for care work at home level. We're talking unpaid care work and we are talking time use deficit at household level. Time, time use deficit basically means that the bulk of the work that is not rewarded is done by women, whether they are working or not. And that is a cost in its own. Whereas the bulk of the men, according to the data that we have, reflects that the majority of the men just do mainly productive work that is paid, 
when they get home, they rest and they don't have to worry about, you know, cooking, taking care of the children and so on and so forth. And what does it mean for the health of the woman? What does it mean for the welfare of the family as a whole? What does it mean for, you know, the energy that the woman or the wife also needs to give to the children, the attention that she needs to give to her children and the husband in most instances? So there's always that fatigue uh, you know, and it affects the health of a woman and it also affects her economic capacity to be able to achieve more in as far as economic rewards is concerned. The list goes on and on and on and on. But the point is, parenting that is effective is important if we really want to achieve gender equality. We require equal contribution by both men and women in the welfare of the homes, in the welfare of our communities, and in the welfare of our children. I'll continue on another round. For now, thank you. Thank you very much, um, Mama Matibela, and thank you very much, Desmond. Um, Desmond spoke about the importance of uh, women and men and women coming together to raise um, their children. Um, he also gave an example of uh, a typical thing like being there at the delivery room but not only at the delivery room, but beyond um, the delivery room. Um, he also spoke about um, how, he also spoke about how it is important that fathers are also there in the grooming of the child because their involvement from the initial stage, it is what will determine their behavior as they grow up. And um, Mama Matibela, she just spoke to us about how fatherhood is a gender issue how it is important that um, we have effective fatherhood in order for us to be able to attain the SDG 5, which is uh, which speaks to gender equality. She also lamented on 5.2, which speaks to gender-based uh, violence, to say, if we don't have effective parenting, how are we going to attain um, the SDG 5.2? I will then um, hand over to Ren. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is uh, Ronald Baka. I'm a vice chairperson at uh, the Gokami Foundation. Uh, uh, going into this issue uh, or this discussion, you know, uh, yeah, yeah. fatherhood in uh, who mean a, a boy child. Uh, what I can say in, uh, is, uh, yeah, it's important for, uh, for men to be there in the grooming of uh, a boy child because. Uh, as a boy, uh, since I'm a boy or since I'm a man, um, what I I experience uh, as a boy when I grow up um, is uh, I grow up in a family whereby, uh, but that let me say I was raised by a single parent. Uh, then so I realized what a, as a single mother when you raise a boy child is difficult because. Uh, there are some issues that need to be discussed uh, by one on one, like a, a man and a, a boy, like uh, like <laughs> like uh, issues like uh, how to treat a woman, like uh, how to take care of your family, like how to be a father, be a good father to your 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 your. your Kids, be a good father to the society because, and I say, as an elder, as an elder, everyone who is in the community of yours is like your father or your mother to you. So you have to know how to treat uh, the people around you, the kids around you, everyone around you. So if you don't, if you don't have that uh, qualities to treat uh, the community or the people around you. You have you do, you don't you don't know or you won't have that you don't have that uh, I'm not sure what to say but to have that to raise your, your kids but um, like what I'm saying is that it's important or it's right for men to be there when on the growth of the kids and uh, yeah I think I said it. Thank you very much, um, Rembaka. Rembaka was simply saying that it is very important for um, 
a father to be present in the lives of their children. Um, highlighting that the man is the one who teaches the child about fatherhood. So if they are not there, it means that there will be a gap. Um, I'll come to my last speaker. Thank you. Well, I'm now representing some gender justice from South Africa. Although I'm Swedish, but it all starts with an S. So try to think of me as Sonke, uh, because these are the words of, of Sonke. Um, and, um, well, Sonke is very happy to have worked together with us on the joint exhibition, uh, because images and illustrations often say much more than a thousand words. So the fact that we see these very engaged and participating fathers can be much more inspirational than whatever we say here this evening. Um, and Sonke is working a lot um, on sort of what they call transformation of household relations, which is dealing with the equal distribution of the unpaid homework um, and really promoting and celebrating um, sort of the role of the father uh, and nurture a more sort of uh, compassionate uh, behavior, uh, which is, as I think has been said now many times, it's crucial for equal, uh, for gender equality and, and the equal possibilities of men and, and women. Um, it's also fundamental for meeting the physical and emotional needs of the children to have sort of uh, gender equal household. Uh, it's also uh, at the core of rescuing men from their own destructive behavior um, to teaching them uh, a less sort of self-destructive uh, behavior by having them engaged uh, in the family. And it's also important for to transform our societies from sort of the base uh, of the family and the household uh, and change it from in many societies something based on, on domination in the family uh, to um, a mutual sort of caregiving and participation. Um, and that is crucial for uh, lowering gender-based violence. Um, and Sonke has made a study in Soweto outside Johannesburg uh, quite recently uh, on sort of violence. Um, and it's some quite scary uh, figures. 56% uh, of the men that they interviewed in the township had um, sort of lived into personal uh, violence uh, or had perpetrated, they themselves had perpetrated sort of interpersonal violence during the last 12 months. 56% of the men. A majority of them had experienced childhood physical or sexual abuse, um, and 84% of them said that they had experienced sort of abuse or neglect. They had not had a participating uh, father. 39% um, of them had been <coughs> raped or molested. Um, in. So with figures like that, it's no surprise that the level of violence, not only gender-based, but <coughs> violence uh, in all. So um, if we want violence against women and, and children and sort of interpersonal violence uh, to lower, we need to tackle some of the root causes. And, and one very important instrument is to have more uh, present and engaged fathers. I think it's also important to note, uh, Sonke Gender Justice in South Africa last year received release their own sort of South African fathers report uh, and where they noted, and I think that's important, it's not only sort of the importance of having a biological father present, it can very well be another father figure that can sort of fill the role because otherwise every single mother would be hopeless. What do I do? So I think it's important to say it's important for children and especially for boys to have a father figure present that also shows. Um, so I think more involved and, and caring and engaged fathers. And now, as you know, 
ambassadors are not allowed to participate in the domestic or get involved in domestic politics. So now I really wear the Sonke hat when I say, <laughs> now you have elections in Botswana this year, go and lobby your members of parliament for parental leave and especially having part of it for the fathers. Thank you. Um, thank you very much um, to my last presenter. She touched on um, some of the work that is being done by Sonke Gender Justice and uh, she highlighted um, the importance of um, promoting and celebrating the role that the fathers play in the households and also their role in the physical and emotional um, and uh, well-being of the children and um, also spoke on the issue of moving from the dominative um, parenting to a more um, participatory parenting where everybody can uh, can play a role in raising a child and she also gave some statistics 56 percent of men in soweto um, i think soweto is is, is the population is bigger than Botswana, but the last study that was done in Botswana it showed that 44% of men had admitted to perpetrating violence at one point in their lifetime, and 67% of women in Botswana had experienced abuse. So this is a very large number that needs to be tackled. Like she said, from the root cause, um, we need to engage fathers, um, not only biological fathers, but also looking at the, um, the father figure that is within um, the household. I will give um, my panelists a uh, last round um, to say a few words before I move on to the audience. Uh, thank you, facilitator. I think when talking about uh, fatherhood, it's important to interrogate our culture as well, to be able to say uh, what are the negative aspects of our culture that influence negative fathering or parenting. What are the negative aspects of our culture that influence negative attitudes towards parenting by men specifically? Really get to the bottom of it with a view to uprooting such. Very important. The other thing uh, that I think is very important, especially when we're speaking male involvement and male engagement, is to really try, let's harness, let's harness the positive energy from men like Red Desmond and his friends to be able to influence other men. Father figures that are in positions of leadership, let's bring them on, on the table so that they can influence other men who are abusers of women, who are abusers of children. Uh, the, the other point that I wanted to raise was, uh, you know, parenting and fatherhood requires a lot of responsibility. And one of them being taking children to school, ensuring that families are healthy and uh, in the process ensuring that child mortality and maternal mortality rates are low. So really fatherhood, good fatherhood is important uh, if we are really to achieve the sustainable development goals in totality so that the well-being of all, including the children, the women, the marginalized, are protected accordingly. I almost said thank you very much. Maybe I should say this. Thank you very much for recognizing me. Thank you very much, Umulimo, uh, also for the opportunity. I think for, for us, one critical thing that we need to be talking about as fathers or as men is the fact that there is need for a lot of change. Because when we look at how we were raised by our fathers, um, unfortunately enough, I, I had a father growing up, but some of my colleagues, some of my friends didn't have fathers. And it's one thing having a father, and it's another having an actual active father. And you'd find that a father figure is always, uh, the, the idea is you need to just provide. So if you can make sure that you're providing for your family, then you're playing a role as a father. But then fatherhood is more than provision. There's care work, there's education, there's role modeling that is part of that. And 
as men, we need them to sacrifice our comfort zone. We need to be the ones that sacrifice the things that we probably uh, learned from our fathers to change that. I'll give you an example. When I was growing up, um, my mother and my sisters, um, I came from a family of three, uh, uh, three children. I was the only boy, two, two, two girls. My, my mother and, and my two sisters would bat together, giggle, talk, and chat. I would never dare go into the bathroom with my father and his bathroom. <laughs> he is still alive today, and he still does not feel comfortable with me going into the bathroom with, when he's there. But, so we, we need to sacrifice that. I need to sacrifice that. I need them to allow my two sons to come into the bathroom. It's not an easy thing, but I need to do it because there's no one who's sitting down and talking to these boy children and teaching them about their bodies, teaching them about how to treat or relate with other people. So it will take that sacrifice. It will take us to be uncomfortable for us to be able to engage with our children. The care work in the house. I have two boys and a girl, and I consider very lucky because everything we teach, if it's cooking, everyone has to cook. If it's cleaning the yard, everyone has to clean the yard. Because that way, it teaches them that when the boys get married, they are not marrying a maid. They're marrying somebody they love. Because a lot of men will say, I want my shirt ironed. I want, you need to cook for me. You need to do this. As if we do not have hands. We have hands. We are able to cook. We are able to clean the house. And that's a reality that we need to teach our kids. And how best do we teach them? By them seeing us doing that. So you might have not learned it from your father, but now that you have the information, then you need to do that. It's not going to be easy, but practice makes perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any last words? Or any words before we close? Just uh, a short, I think, has been said. The, the, I mean, this is a process that takes time. You have to change attitudes. And therefore, I think it's important to have the role models, that you have men showing openly that they're taking their responsibility, they're doing this, they're in the delivery room or they're taking leave to be with their children uh, because that inspires others and that slowly changes attitudes, uh, I think. I mean, in Sweden it's changed now to the effect that it would be difficult, I think, for a young father to say to his friends, I'm not taking paternity leave. That's for that, it's It's not politically correct, it's not uh, accepted anymore. That has taken some time, but I mean, it's a process. So I think to, to work uh, on that. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. Um, she is talking about how we socialize our children. Every time everything comes up, we, we, we blame socialization, but when you look at who socializes, it's us parents. Now she's calling to say, how do we ensure that our children unlearn the behaviors that we taught them and learn new behaviors, positive behaviors? Say. Uh, uh, on my point of view, now I realize how uh, we as uh, boy children, uh, or the boy that is living in me today, or the man that is living in me today, is how I've been raised. Uh, that's the, uh, the way I behave in the industry, the way I behave in the society, that's the, uh, the way they go for how I raised. So uh, nowadays we, we, we get oil. So officially Thank you very much. Yeah, what he was simply saying was that um, the, here in, in our country, we, we have a lot of young fathers who 
don't even have a clue of how to raise their children. And in the end, they run away. They don't take responsibility um, of taking care of their children. Um, I will then give an opportunity to my audience. If we have comments, I'll just, I'll just take three or four people. No, it's fine. Let me do the running up. Oh, thanks, thanks, thanks so much. Nice. Um, thank you so much for this great platform. Um, the art is very powerful. I think I, I want to start there just because the images say so much and we don't see enough of such images. Um, two questions. Firstly, I want to find out how far your lobbying efforts are in the way of um, parental leave. Um, she mentioned lobbying. I don't know if you'll translate it for um, it, you know, where, what's the, the structure like? I mean, it's not really uh, something that individuals are just going to do by themselves, you know, so what what uh, bodies are we looking at? And then the second one is slightly a bit more controversial. Um, it's an interesting time. I think it goes without saying that this is probably one of the most uh, gender sensitive times of all humanity, right? Um, an example from this morning, there's a guy called Terry Crews if you know Terry Crews, an actor, um, been very vocal about a lot of gender issues. And this morning, he, he put his foot in his mouth by saying that um, uh, children should have both parents. Um, by saying that, I think he, he, the phrase he used was that children who don't have their fathers in their lives are malnourished, you know. And it offended a lot of people to a point where, you know, senior members of the LGBT uh, Q movement um, were coming out for his head, you know. Um, what's your take on that? How do we show the value of a man in this society today, a man and his family, without being seen, um, let me not even say being seen, um, without building up the walls of patriarchy that we're struggling to tear down as we speak right now. Um, you know, lastly, I, I'm a husband but not a father yet. So I really do think what you've done uh, is very great as, as a preparatory kind of um, session. And I would advise that you do consider how you cascade this for the public. Because a lot of these progressive ideas, unfortunately, are very elitist. You don't, you tend, to, uh, truth, you know, you tend to find that the, the average person on the street feels this is a whole bunch of mambo jumbo, you know. Thank you. My name is Lydia Mafugodita, a gender activist. Um, I think for me, this is a journey. The journey that takes a very long time if we look at Sweden. And I'm not sure this journey that we want to take as Botswana, we have already mapped out the way do we begin and how we want to do it. And when do you want to do it? And who should do what? Um, we just completed, as a consultant, we are doing the mainstreaming of gender, HIV AIDS, and human rights into the Ministry of Infrastructure and Housing Development and, and Transport and Communication. The most difficult thing is that with that study was, before you could ask a question, what's for you to educate the engineers what gender is and what gender is not, and what mainstreaming is and what mainstreaming is not. So for me, we need to find those low hanging fruits to make sure that we start this journey with everybody. So why am I saying this? Because you know, they did not see the role of this ministry. Who is responsible for building all the roads where our children are going to walk and our elderly people are going to walk? And they did not see their role. Those who build all the public buildings. No, they, did, they, they just said, no, Lydia, they are toilets for men and women. And for them, that is gender. So I think for me, we need a lot of education. That is very important. And then the other one has already been mentioned. I think we have a 
very rich culture. A lot of times when people talk about culture, they actually mention the negatives. They never really root it to why those things were done. And if you ask, you find that a lot of things in our culture was done for the good. It may not apply now, but we need to find out why were those things done. A lot of them really, even why fathers were kept out was a prevention method, as you have said it. But there's a lot of more on what it. And I think for us, we need to have a very robust cultural dialogues to identify those uh, gen gender norms that no longer apply, those gender norms that will actually promote fathers in participating. And then the last one, Madam Facilitator, is that we really need to talk to the custodian of culture. Every time we talk about this, we find that I left my daughter when she was 11 months. When the father was taking her to the clinic, it was not men who were asking, where is the mother? It was mothers. And they were, they were even giving him, I would say, presidential treatment of the nurses even coming and taking the, ch the child from him. So I think, you know, we need to educate because it is us as women who are not giving the fathers the right space to take care of their children. Because we always feel we have been brought up by our mothers. So we, we don't know how good it is because children are missing. Those first eight years are very critical for the children to learn from both parents. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sorry. In, in for us to be able to give others chance, well, can you please move the mic to the side so the people who had raised their hands? Good evening. My name is uh, Skiwe Mguni from Weaver Women Business. I actually have a, a question, or maybe a B. I don't know really what to do at this point. But briefly, I was handed um, a, a grandchild a son by my first cousin who passed away. The boy was four years old. Quickly, when he, I, I took him when he was six to go to from standard one. So when he was doing standard two, he came with an assignment. He has to come to, with the name of a nuclear family. His mother's name, his father's name, what they were doing, and the siblings. Then I realized that I really didn't know much about this boy. I called the mother and asked, what is what is what's going on here? What is the who's the father? Where is he? And you know what she said? Some of you don't even know very well that women say this. But ah, what I'm jayu, I'm tere. It simply it means that a dog. So I said no, but this is important. The child has to take this homework. So he told me and gave the contact and everything. Initially, when I contacted the man, he was very happy, and then he wanted to be in the child's life. But since six years old, the boy is now ten years old. We have only had about three instances where we met. And then I asked him to, to tell me what, what is going on. He actually went to say that, why don't I just, why don't, why don't you just give me this child? Because he doesn't want this child. I was like, this is terrible. Then I went to the channel, asked him, what can we do with this man? They said, as long as he says he doesn't like the child or doesn't love the child, there's no law that's going to force him to, to love the child. Therefore, and then I went to the mother. They said the only thing we can do is to ask for maintenance. The mother said she's not doing it because she's afraid that the man is going to kill his child. I think we have got cases like this in Botswana where men have literally killed children for that. Then when I saw Desmond uh, on TV and I thought maybe I can go and find out what they can do because at this point I can see that the boy is 10 years old now. I can see that I'm raising a boy who may end up being a murderer, hitting women, killing women. Because all the time when I try to reprimand him, he's always saying that I'm going to tell my father lovingly. And I feel so, so much pain because I was raised with my father. My father was always telling us that we are beautiful, we are his girls, and he was proud of us. And I can see that this boy is really liking this. So I'm saying, I need help. What can I do as a step uh, grandmother? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mayor. I will take the last one from that side and then go to our panelists and then be advised if we still have more time.
Good evening, my name is Misa Mate, I'm a radio presenter. And interestingly, we had this conversation uh, to some extent this afternoon when we were talking about absenteeism. And what we were talking about earlier, I was actually um, encouraging people to recognize the fact that young fathers nowadays, when you walk through malls, are they pushing um, their kids around and they're playing with them, so on and so forth. And I got the shock of my life when a caller was calling to say that, look, I know exactly what you're talking about, but what you're seeing there might be a father who's taking care of somebody else's daughter. Somebody who is, what I might say, is vacationing into another home and taking care of somebody else's problems as opposed to taking care of his uh, daughter or his son who he has since neglected. So we're seeing a lot of this. And what then this does is that you find somebody coming in on a short-term lease. And if somebody's coming in there and is not ready to make a long-term investment, then, Mr. Lunga, they will come in there and be active as fathers, play with the kids, but they know that they can always step out whenever they want to. So that's one thing that I'd like to maybe uh, try to see how you, you would, you would uh, perhaps tackle it. Another thing is this very traditionalist mentality of virility. Back in the days, it was an expression of virility to have many children. And now it goes back to this issue where me as a young father, I'm going around and I'm boasting that I have many firstborn children. Can I leave firstborn And I'm here, I'm the man, because look, I'm fertile, I'm at the height of my, my, my masculinity. But at the same time, I am generating something which is going to be so difficult to manage in the future. So how do you, how do you begin to attend to things like this? How do we undo certain behaviors of this nature? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I will give opportunity to our panelists to answer before I take last two people. Thank you, facilitator, and thank you so much for the comments and for the questions. And let me first respond to the question around advocacy for law reform in as far as paternity leave is concerned. Um, I must say that that conversation at the moment does not exist, at least at government level. However, I want to believe that this is a topic of interest, this is a topic of national interest, and civil society organizations and other key stakeholders that are concerned about this issue can actually organize themselves and strategize, put together a clear advocacy strategy and start having conversations with the right uh, you know, uh, ministries with the right leaders and with the right partners to push for law reform in that regard. I want to believe that there's so many good examples that Botswana can learn from. I mean, South Africa, Sweden, a whole lot of other countries globally. And our advocacy strategy, if it speaks to the right issues, if it touches on the benefits of paternity leave in a very constructive manner, the benefits for gender equality and how it will contribute to sustainable development. You know, how it will benefit the children and the welfare of the children. How it will benefit our societal, you know, uh, fabric. So I think that is something that can be done right away or whenever uh, the, the organizations that are, are concerned are ready. Because really we live, uh, you know, in times where both parents have to... Uh, engage in productive work and it's critical that uh, the parents, both parents are given equal opportunity as well to uh, enjoy their parenting. Uh, I was not writing on time, try to remember all, all the questions and comments. Uh, and uh, the comment by Mem Mama Debesi on uh, custodians of culture, very concerning indeed. You know, often when we speak of uh, custodians of patriarchy or, or, or yeah, yeah we think of men, we think of the chiefs, the traditionalists, but actually even women are. And uh, I'm always very sympathetic when women are blamed or battered for doing that because, you know, after all, we are all, you know, products of patriarchy, aren't we? 
We are all brought up in a society that preaches the same negative culture, negative norms, and of course, uh, bearing in mind that there are those that are positive, but those that are negative impact all of us. So women also, especially traditional ones, deserve some kind of mercy by way of, really, let us educate, let us raise awareness, let us sensitize all the custodians of patriarchy and negative culture, including our mothers, including those traditionalists at home, including the chiefs, the Kosi, uh, so that they all appreciate what it means, uh, you know, uh, what gender equality is about and why women's empowerment is important and why the protection of children is key. So it's a process, it's a long journey. We have a long way to go. To uproot patriarchy is not a joke. It's hard, it's difficult. Uh, it's not only women that are not ready, but some men are also not ready. I know that uh, in conversations around uh, equal representation of women and men in political leadership, I know that most men are not ready to share power. Not now. And it's a, it's a battle. So there's a lot of work that we all have to do in our different constituencies. And I believe that... Uh, uh, yes. Uh, the other comment was uh, in, uh, in relation to the negative uh, cultures and the positive cultures. Yes, indeed. I support Mama Debesi. Let's capitalize on the positive uh, norms and, and culture that promotes gender equality, that promotes uh, peace, that promotes uh, development, that promotes uh, protection of children from GBV. Let us promote those and capitalize on them. But let us not hesitate to speak out on the negative culture that takes us back 50 years backwards. Really, we have even to mention them by name and remove them um, from the roots. Uh, yes, I think that's basically it. Thank you very much. Um, let me start off with you know, we, we, I think as, as men, we, we need to start being honest to ourselves. Um, we need to start understanding that the so-called privileges that we think we have are actually not privileges. Um, because a lot of times, society has allowed us as men to get away with negativity. And um, from that negativity be praised of being a man because you're negative. And a lot of times in our own spaces as men, we, we boast about that negativity and glorify it. And I think we, we need to start being open and honest to ourselves. When, when somebody tells you he's got six, seven first ones in this era with HIV, we, we, we need to be able to call out such behavior. Because at the end of the day, we do not respect ourselves as men. We are using our own bodies. It's, it's, it's us. So we need to be able to call out such behaviors. We need not to praise such behaviors. And we need to be exemplary. I, I believe there is a lot of good men, but they're actually shy to go out there because they think, what that do we just see it? So we need to be brave about it. Be brave about being a good man. Be able to call out negative behaviors. And um, maybe attempting to answer um, your, your challenge, the one thing I've, I've realized, which is quite a, a broad thing with um, absent fathers, a lot of times, a lot of mothers want to protect their kids from these men because they feel this man was terrible to me and therefore is not going to be good uh, to this child. But the, the, the sad reality is that when that happens, it backfires because the child starts to blame you and they think they're not seeing their father because of you. So it's important for you to allow this child in a safe environment to get to know this man and let that child be the one that decides that this man is not good. Because if you don't, then they would think there was a better person, a better man um, that they could have learned from, but you denied them that. So it's very important for us to allow these kids to know these men. I know we are trying to protect them from getting hurt, but then that's how, one way of learning. 
And a lot of people would say, because you grow up without a father, uh, the chances that you are going to be negative. Sometimes, because you didn't grow up with a father, you'd want to be a better man to your kids. So I think, let's expose these kids to these men. Let them be the judges. I know it's, it's tough love, but then it's better that way than the child fighting with you. And another thing that we also need to do is that we have family members. We have uncles, we have uh, brothers that can play that father role. We need to allow these men to interact with these kids. We need to allow these men to become fathers. They don't necessarily need to be biological fathers for them to, 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 to raise uh, boy children. And I would say it's a challenge to men, those positive men, to say we have a lot of other children to raise. And it goes back to also to Misang's question that uh, some men are, are raising other men's children, which is not wrong. But then we're afraid that maybe that man is going to run away or is going to give up. But that is the reality of life. Sometimes they're never there throughout. Sometimes they die. Sometimes something happens to them. So let's not be afraid to be fathers because we're afraid or allow our kids to have fathers because we're afraid they'll disappoint them. I think if we can allow that space. And I'll also attempt to say, uh, talk about the issue of advocacy and how far we are. I always say we need to see the society, we need to see men taking up those roles. You know, it's, it's, not, it's one thing us going and saying we need to change this, but then are the men ready? Are they going to use this uh, uh, leave properly? Are we seeing men taking their kids to clinic? Are we seeing men playing that father, 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 father role? So the moment we are able to engage in different communities, and raise a generation of men that are going to stand up and that are going to be there, and then definitely the policies are going to fall in place. But advocacy is about bringing together uh, people and having a collective voice, and it should talk to what we see in our communities. So for, for, for us as men and boys and, and as, as men engaged, we believe we need to start going into those spaces, have fatherhood uh, programs, let's see men being positive, Let's see men going into clinics. Then we'll be able to say we definitely need time off for us to be able to do this. And also find a time to attempt uh, to answer the question of where do we start? The Men Care Program is one program that I think is important for us to start from the pregnancy. When uh, a mother goes to register for pregnancy at the hospital, let uh, uh, the hospital have a, a support group for men. And I know being a father is something that you can be taught. You can learn to be a father. So if we can create these spaces um, where there is support groups for these men, they can be able to go, they can be able to learn how to be a man. They can be able to share stories from other men. And we've seen that work. We've seen some of this work, uh, work throughout the globe, and it can work for Botswana. And as men and boys, we've decided we want to work in the hard to reach areas. We want to go to Shakawe, we want to go to Hansi, we want to start with those men because that's where maybe some of these resources are not available for, for, for these men. So I'll try and, and, and there. I don't know if I uh, managed to answer all the questions. Okay. Uh, my, my well. um, how, do we, how do we make men feel comfortable to talk about their It's just about promoting positive masculinity, right? Yeah, um, and, and we need to understand um, that patriarchy has its own space. And I think when we celebrate men, we need to understand that when you are a positive man, a lot of times it, it has nothing to do with patriarchy. Like if you are going to be celebrating a man who's cleaning his house, celebrating a man who's taking care of his child. So it's, it's minus Patrick. And so a lot of times I know we tend to say, this man is now taking his child to clinic and therefore they are taking, they're getting uh, treatment because you'd find that the people that are giving us services would then celebrate this man because I came with my child, I jumped the line. So it means, it means we still have a lot of work to do with even the females. 
And also, us as men needs to be able to call it out. When I get to the clinic and they say, jump the line, I say, no, no, no. Why? I've brought my child just like everybody else who's here. So there are these privileges, but we need to always be aware of them. And I think the more we start talking about it, the more we, 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 we engage, the more society is starting to start to learn and start to change. Yeah, let me briefly also say that, you know, there's no way we can celebrate patriarchy at all. Actually, patriarchy does not have space in our society. You know what patriarchy means? By definition, patriarchy is male dominance that oppresses women. So there's no way that we can even talk about patriarchy. However, there's room to celebrate men. There's room to celebrate positive masculinity and to celebrate men that are good fathers and men that are responsible in society. It's important that we celebrate them. So let's separate and exclude patriarchy completely because it's not needed. We need to remove it actually. Thank you. Just a, a comment to Mrs. Lydia. Uh, just to make it clear, I'm not advocating that Botswana has to do exactly the route that Sweden has done. I think it's important that every country has to find its own way to do it. And we come from different cultures and everything. So, And you are the wisest in, in how to do it. I do agree with you completely when you say all these processes start at home and we have to start with ourselves as women. I was just commenting with my colleague earlier today about this. I mean, we both have the privilege of very present and engaged fathers, but oh my dear, how difficult it was when the children were small to, to actually let go and let them have a go at it. And just one comment on the issue of the young men that are so virile and, and masculine. I think it's a great difference between virility, to me that's a sort of physical quality. <laughs> yes, you may be able to produce children by this. Masculinity, I think, is a completely different thing. And that means that you're mature, you can take care. And to me, the, the first question to these young men bragging about having lots of children on the town, so how are you caring for them? Do you want your sons to grow up being sort of cared for, being able to go through school? and that's masculinity, that you actually are a father with all, not only in the physical sense of producing sperms. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nam. Um, uh, Pio, and then uh, I'll have... And I've been getting number of thrusts this side. Guys, oh, why don't you if you don't, don't think it's my kid? It's unfortunate. We can't, we can't, <laughs> you know, we can't have more hours and minutes than what we already have. Everybody's uh, we'll take I it. I think there were about five friends now. Maybe if can just... A minute each, just so everyone is satisfied. We know we're behind time, but let's just give them a chance. You, okay, right. yeah, no, fine. Um, but please, let's keep to our minute. Okay, um, hello, my name is Pio Kenosi. I'm from Rainbow Identity Association. Um, I, 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 oh, I have a, a, quite a few points here. I want to actually talk about the fact that uh, we have young fathers now coming up, and uh, they're getting the system, they're inheriting a system where men would run away from responsibility, and it's 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 a, it's, it's a system that then teaches them that it's okay to not be responsible fathers, to not be engaged fathers. What I want to know is how is it that we can curb this reoccurrence? Perhaps I I know that uh, in certain areas where they had high rates of teenage pregnancy. Uh, by teenagers, they they implemented uh, uh, family classes where they learn how to take care of a kid from the get go uh, w uh, with with a robot baby, and they they got uh, scored from from that. So I want to know if this is something that we think is feasible within our context. Um, I also want to talk about how uh, we can get uh, parents or fathers specifically to be more engaged in. Uh, ch uh, a child's understanding of their sexuality and their gender presence, and how then that would, uh, you know, make the world as, as a whole a little bit better for queer children. Because the truth of the matter is that straight people produce queer babies, and then so we have that problem. So now we have two different, uh, you know, polarized ideas. How do we then merge them, and how do we then create a, a situation where it's safe? for children to have these conversations with their parents. Thank you, Pio. Can I speak? Yes, Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. 
Uh, my name is Onike Lukbimton. I've been told I must mention that I'm the author of uh, the book, Yeah, My Body Belongs to Me. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Desmond. <laughs> um, what I was going to say is, I'll try and be really quick. Um, recently, I went uh, shopping with my son, who's 10 years old. And this man, young man, came up to me. Yeah, I didn't know. Oh. Okay, me okay. again. Um, and this young man came up to me and he asked me if um, I was a single mother. And I said yes, and I asked why. And he said, because when he looks at my son, he can see that my son is raised by a woman. Um, I wasn't sure how to react to that. Because on the one hand, I was offended. But on the other hand, um, I started looking at myself as a single mother because I'm that single mother who uh, overcompensates. I work hard uh, all day, that productive work thing. I come home and I have to be that full-time mother. I pass out and then the following day do it all over again. Um, and I've been, I've thought about the whole idea of getting male role models for my child. But at the same time, we're living in a time where that uncle, that lover, that whatever that I'm going to be with my son may actually end up being his molester. Um, so I, I just want to know, just going forward with people like us, because I'm sure there are many onikas out there, um, how do we, maybe you can give us some tips on how we actually get men to be involved in our children's lives and still keep them safe and still not feel guilty about um, being single moms, who do a great job, by the way. <clears throat> Uh, good evening. Um, my, uh, sorry, a, a question, but a comment. Um, going to the issue of advocacy and public education. I think it might be important to look at the value that we want to derive from having, I guess, good parenthood, um, both mothers and fathers being involved. What is that value that we want? Because in Botswana, Sometimes being happy or finding joy is something that we sort of like shy away from. Um, but when we look into issues of fatherhood and just parenting, it boils down to you know issues of well-being um, and and happiness and and joy and and contentment. So what? How do we take that those values and really entrench them in in in, in, in our society? as values to uphold, so that when we talk about having both parents, um, you know, it's, it's actually a value that we, 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 we embrace and, and embody as a society. So just moving forward, I, it, it'll be interesting for me to really see how we talk about issues of happiness and well-being as a society. All right, please just be quick, time is not on our side. Thank you very much. My name is Lisa Hovalefe. Um, out of curiosity, I'm going to ask something very controversial. As much as we've been talking about the importance of uh, fathers being there on the upbringing and development of their children, how then do um, gender activists um, reach out for fathers who've been locked in prisons? As much as, yes, of course, there are, have been convicted of different criminal acts, the fact and the reality is they are still fathers. So how do we reach out to them? How do we share this kind of information with them to try to empower them and appreciate uh, the father uh, journey that they have been there uh, for that children? Thank you very much. Um, my name is Chawabi Omathaya. I am a gender activist. Um, I think I'm going to go back to what Hannah said about celebrating men. Um, I think we should not celebrate men because we should be talking about positive masculinity. We should be talking about taking responsibility to my action. In other words, when we're celebrating men, we are saying, oh, hey, he was a spam donor. I'm celebrating him for being present. We shouldn't. Um, we should rather be saying he is doing his rights and responsibilities and he deserves no privileges 
because he is a father. That's the baseline. We should go back to the baseline. He is a father. When are we going to celebrate motherhood? It, when, when we see a mother doing something wrong, we all go on top of the world and scream and say, she did this. And we don't, and we don't forget, she went through depression, there is maternal depression, she goes home, she's too tired to do homework, but homework is due tomorrow. So we should not be celebrating men. We should rather encourage them to take responsibility of when they had sex and enjoyed it. And they should also enjoy being fathers. I think going to her, to your question of how do we engage men that are in prisons, I think that's one of those conversations that um, as gender activists we're really having and saying, how do we engage these men and making sure that they're not left behind? It doesn't matter that he's on the death row. He's still a father. How do we now go into our justice system and work within the justice system to allow them access? How do we make prison it goes to the question of how do we make prison a child-friendly space? In the sense that when you look at developed countries, children, there's family day, there's family fun day. When are we moving to that space as Botswana? Because when you go into our prisons, the many people that are there are men. So it means that they are missing the milestones of their own children. They come back and they are a stranger because they are not allowed into the prison grounds. You are under 16. No, you cannot come and see your father. You grow up just knowing that my father killed somebody. It's okay that he killed somebody. You were not there. But by he, you being present and you going and seeing him, he will teach you the responsibilities. He has seen the bad in his actions and he will teach you not to become like him. So I think it goes into our justice system. Last one. Good evening. Thank you, ma'am. I would just maybe as a comment to say, can we have the data and statistics when we speak to these issues? Um, we're talking about uh, the lack of uh, paternity leave in Botswana. I work for an organization um, that has paternity leave in our terms and conditions of service. And there are men that actually, majority of them, do take paternity leave. So as we work towards this ideal, let us ensure that we really understand from the data perspective um, where we are um, in order to achieve where we're going. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'll hand over to my presenters. We are really out of time. Um, so I'll just give them 10 minutes between all of them. Between all of you. Three minutes. Okay, three minutes. Uh, thank you very much. I don't think there's much that I can say really, but just to say thank you for the comments and for the inputs. And I really appreciate the last input on data. Data, data, data. Really, everything that we talk about, it's important to have you know, uh, evidence-based data that can inform our decisions, that can inform our policy that, uh, that can inform our laws, so it's quite critical. I do appreciate that there are some private sector companies that actually implement paternity law. However, it is still not law in Botswana, so that's the advocacy we are talking about. So what can we learn from those companies that do uh, uh, apply paternity leaves in their companies? So there's so much information that we, s we really have to gather and share and use to inform our decisions. Yeah, well, very difficult questions. <laughs> I don't think we have the answers for those questions. But like I, I said, attempting to, to, to answer the question around um, uh, teaching your, your kids around sexuality issues. And I'm saying, I, I think as men, we need to learn to be uncomfortable because we, 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 we have no other choice. So we need to start having these difficult conversations with our kids. And we need to learn more as men and open up and speak more and be able to play with our kids. Somebody was talking about emotions. Let's not be known as the disciplinarians, uh, the angry fathers. Let's play, let's laugh, let's enjoy being, being fathers, yeah. Uh, hello. Hello. Yeah. Aba sadi ba emisi wotsosa ana kabawa. 
Thank you. I have no comments or answers. I just want to say on behalf of uh, the Swedish Embassy and of Somki Gender Justice, the two S's, thank you very much. And I'm, I must say I'm very impressed and happy with the very active discussion. And I hope we can then continue in a little while when we will mingle and have some refreshments. Thank you. Thank you very much to my panelists. Um, let's go educate. Let's go educate. Um, let's go create spaces for men to participate. Um, let's go advocate. And most of all, let's get out of our comfort zone. I think somebody got us out of our comfort zone by asking whether we should be celebrating men. I, I saw a lot of us clinch. Um, thank you very much. Um, You're right. Thanks so much. Let's give them a round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, listening to the discussion here, yeah, I just remembered my father's words. By then I was still in high school. High school. He told me, he called me and told me, my son, whatever you do in life, just make sure that you start a family while you're still young and you're still active. And make sure, underline, make sure that you are there for your family. And he said, I'm telling you this because I was never there for you when you were growing up. You understand? And then my man was like, yeah, there, where were you? But not that he was a bad, a bad, bad father, no, no, no. It's just that he was too busy. And looking at the culture then, that the father had to be someone else and just to come in, check in after four months of uh, delivery. But now times have changed. We're not saying we, we're taking our culture. We're Africans, we value our culture. But all we're saying is times have changed. Back in the days, our mothers were mostly housewives. Now we have partners that both wake up early in the morning to go to work, 8 to 5. That we cannot expect that wife of yours to do the, the other things that say, no, because you are a woman, you have to do that. It doesn't have to, to, to be like that. We have to change and move at the times, but not discarding the culture. And like Desmond was saying, I being in the delivery room when we um, uh, welcomed our only bundle of joy. Five years of marriage, but that was the only time I appreciated my wife more. Not that because she's a bad woman, not that because I, didn't, I don't love her or I didn't love her. Just being there made me realize a lot of things. I remember once we got off, I was like, you know what, I, now I know you inside out, literally. <laughs> and it's, the other thing is, most of the time, our fathers will be, they will, be, will not be there when the kids are still growing. And they'll try to make up for that time by material things. Most of the fathers today, they believe once you have money, you can buy your child a, a car, a Lamborghini at the age of six, just to show, to show them you love them. It's wrong. It doesn't have to be like that. Without wasting time, moving on. And one thing, uh, we can bet. It is very, 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 very easy to destroy something you are never part of its building. That is why today we fathers, we can kill their kids. Fathers, we can abuse their kids because they were never there. They never saw that beauty, that little thing. They were never there to, to, to be there, to see that thing grow. They just know that, okay, uh, going back to the, my sister, they were celebrate them. Yeah, for me, celebrate me, no? Yeah. All right, moving on now, let's get to you the, let's call Mata Palai. Mata Palai is here. Oh, he's there. Now we're getting two reflections from exhibitors. 
so I believe you're the man behind uh, all that. Oh, lovely. Now we can grab the mic and just uh, take us through everything. I'm proud you for that. The viewers here, the people here, will have something to say. Hello, everyone. I want to say much because I'm the one of the photographers that I did that in Nepal, and I managed to get position two. Wow. So me doing that, I was not interested in anything, just money. But I just realized that one day I'm going to be a father, so I need to up my games. Yeah, that's all I can say. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Mata. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome uh, the keynote speaker. Uh, I believe she's here now. Let's welcome the keynote speaker, Mayor Bamiki Kamanakao. Hope I'm pronouncing it right. Let's give it a round of applause. Thank you, Director of Ceremonies. Uh, I know that uh, keynote speaking at this moment will be extremely boring because I've been here and I've enjoyed all the discussions that uh, have already ensued. And uh, like I have been introduced, my name is Mamiki Kamanakao. I am chairperson of the National Children's uh, Council, working closely with Mr. Lunga, who is the deputy chairperson of the National Children's Council. So he is also a national father. He's not just a father at his household, but he's a father for the entire nation. And I just want to stand first of all to apologize. I have a young father who is aspiring to be a counselor and made the worst blunder of my life this afternoon to lend him my vehicle. And the rest of the story you can tell, the cell phone has been off from 4 p.m. and his battery died until he arrived home when I was already walking to the Texas. So I really genuinely apologize for my late appearance. And like I'm saying, I, I really feel it will be too boring at this moment to uh, give a keynote speak or a keynote uh, because I've, I've listened to the conversations here, very interesting and even very educative to me because I come from, you know, that generation. And I, I'm, 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 I'm saying to myself, am I really appropriate uh, to be chairperson of the National Children's Council? If I were to sit with young people and they begin to tell me, I'm a lesbian. What are you as the chairperson of the National Children's Council going to do to advocate for my rights? Because if, if you are a chairperson of the National Children's Council, the assumption is that you represent all children, regardless of who they are, regardless of their sexual preferences. So for me, Really, I think the most important thing, uh, Relunga had said I should share briefly the role of the National Children's Council. And I would say that one of the biggest roles of the National uh, Children's Council is to coordinate, monitor, and work very closely with different sectors in government in all issues that impact uh, the rights of children in Botswana. But one of our also greatest role is to advocate. So I am very excited to be part of uh, this group today because as I was sitting there, I was really getting educated and I have noted a lot of things that I think uh, it is a privilege to be working with uh, Relunga in the council to be able to say, how do we make sure we, we take these issues up as we go around and, uh, and advocate it? Because 
we have been given that platform of advocacy and we are representing the views of children and we have been sent by the government of Botswana. And uh, uh, I was going through Facebook yesterday and just looking at the comments that were coming from uh, the fathers, the young fathers, the male, uh, the male, the males in Botswana. And interestingly, the same brother, my brother, that I'm, I just uh, told you about, I went to see what he said. And what he said in his posting was, you know, he as a man is feeling so emotionally abused because he's the mother to the child to his child is not allowing her to access the child and then i'm seated here and i'm like okay i'm a mother i'm almost your role your your role model as a mother have i brought you up in a way that had this lady allowed you to access this child, will you be able to father this child? So really issues of fatherhood go deeper than the, the presence of the father in the, in the life of the child. And also as just a, a child development specialist, I want us to look at fatherhood from uh, a life cycle approach. I read a lot of research this, uh, these past few days and a lot of research shows that fatherhood should actually start from the moment of conception when the baby is being conceived. And research is saying because that has impact on the investment of, that the woman then attaches to her pregnancy. And invest, investment here does not only talk about financial investment. It talks about emotional investment. So if you are a father and neglects that child during the time when they are being carried, you must know how much you are impacting into the future of that child because of the type of investment that the mother is going to bring into that child. An unhappy mother obviously releases negative emotions to this child. And by the time this child is born, you as the father, because of how you treated the mother, you have already predetermined the trajectory, lifestyle, or the way this child is going to grow. And the studies show that a lot of children that have brought that that uh, grew up from homes where the, the father might be present but abusing the mother. These children are likely to become delinquent children. And these children are likely to, to, to in their partnering and in their fathering lifestyle, they are likely to repeat the same thing that their fathers did. So it is, it is more something that keeps on repeating and it has a it has a ripple effect i'm not going to say much i think i have we have uh, i've said to relunga that we should have done away with speeches and gave more time to the the lively discussion that was going on uh, right now but i just want to thank you uh, and say as the national children's council working closely with Relunga. We are really very open to learn a lot. I, I would like to meet with that youngster who talked about uh, issues of how do we engage and begin to talk about the rights of children whose sexual preference might be something that we feel uncomfortable to talk about. So if, if, for example, you even look at our curriculum, our delivery of early childhood development programs, how do we begin to put in all these evolving issues about children? So these are very, very uh, critical conversations. And 
the police, the National Children's Council is currently housed at the Department of Social Protection in the Ministry of Local Government uh, and Rural Development. Feel free to stop by if you want to engage us. If you want to advocate on such certain issues and you want us to partner with you, that's what, what we are here for. Thank you very much for listening. All right. Thanks so much, Monsadiami, for the wise words. I know it's been a long day and a long, fruitful day. We learned a lot today. What, uh, most people got motivated today. Now let's welcome uh, uh, UNICEF representative, uh, Ms. Juliana Lindsay, for the closing remarks. And then after that, we'll get to uh, Peter Sivre from uh, Men and Boys. Thank you very much. And good evening to everyone, all protocol observed. I know that I stand between you and refreshment, so I just want to mention two things. The first is a shout out. I do want to celebrate my husband, but because he is being a parent, not because he's doing anything special, he's not here this evening because he's home with our daughter. He's fixing dinner, he's making sure that she did her homework, and I don't think I'm gonna make it home for stories, so he's reading stories and he's singing songs to her. He was in the delivery room when I gave birth. He took two months off to be with us. And in the United States, we are the absolute worst on the planet when it comes to family leave. He did not get a single day of paternity leave. Women who work for the United States federal government don't get a single day of maternity leave. Go figure that out. And he still took two months of his annual leave to be with us. And this is not a guy who well, put it this way, my husband is a man's man. He likes his cigars, he likes his whiskey, he goes hunting, he goes fishing, he lifts weights, and he still is the guy who's home tonight putting our daughter to bed and made sure that he took time off when she was born. So I want to, to give you that example as well. The second thing I want to say is picking up on what Desmond mentioned earlier regarding getting outside of the comfort zone. And I want to ask each of you, in the spirit of the Essing Mangwaneng campaign that's been running for a few months and will continue for a few months, to try to get outside your comfort zone, and especially fathers, talk to your children about sexual abuse. The booklet that Onika has made, which is in both English and in Setswana, is a great tool to help you do that. It's not easy. God knows it's hard to sit down and talk to our children, my daughter included, about these issues. But the booklet makes it easy because if you can't think about what to say, you can just sit with your child and read the words. If even that is too much, leave it on the kitchen table. Your son, your daughter will pick it up, will read it, and maybe they'll come to you with some questions or with some ideas or with some thoughts or with some suggestions. So I hope that each of us can take this challenge to talk with our children about this issue, whether in English or in Setswana. Monica has the books here in Tapong. Um, and so I hope that that's something that we can walk away with. Thank you all very much. It's been a very inspirational evening, and UNICEF is very privileged to be a part of it. All right. That's the session. Okay, we're now Umarazin. I can just introduce you from the side. And also have uh, a video, guys, don't go as yet after everything is done. We still have something interesting to watch today. Uh, so your mic is there. <laughs> uh, Director of Ceremonies, Ambassador of Sweden, um, Ambassador of Sweden, sorry, Cecilia Julie, and Head of Diplomatic Corps present here. Bomau President Philemon Meso, colleagues from the movement, our storytellers be the photographers, members of the media fraternity, distinguished guests, I greet you all. Um, there's, there's, uh, there's most definitely nothing easy about uh, saying tonight's vote of thanks as it culminates through a journey that began in 2018 of considerable planning and implementation that speaks to a ch change in the status quo of a long entrenched culture uh, of gender and masculinity. 
Um, I must begin by acknowledging that most of us draw strength from a higher power, diligently conduct the work that we do in the, this ever-changing, sometimes volatile world. And as such, I'd like to give uh, the almighty God glory for making tonight's occasion a resounding success. Um, Your Excellency, Cecilia Julie, uh, thank you for your nation's commitment in transforming our world into one that is equitable and sustainable from the various perspectives of gender and other social and economic standpoints. Your presence this evening and the support extended to this course is a testament to your commitment to a better world. Um, I look around the room and paint a photographic picture in my mind of the faces that capture possibility, resilience, and transformation. Possibility, resilience, and transformation echoed through the respective speakers this evening on the program. Partnership is key to ensuring that the progressive and successful rollout of such initiatives, and I would thus extend a heartfelt thank you to the panelists this evening uh, for as your participation doesn't speak to your contributions this evening, but to the strong partnerships that Men and Boys for Gender Equality and your respective organizations have established over the years. We sometimes highlight in our societies that our children are forgotten. However, on this note, especially to the representative of UNICEF, Juliana Lindsay, I would like to say thank you for ensuring that our children are never forgotten in our society and your remarks this evening. May I also say a special thank you to Sonke Gender Justice for the support they have given us since the establishment of the Men Engaged Network in Botswana and the establishment of Men and Boys for Gender Equality. Um, we are what we are because of the support that we've been given by Sonke Gender Justice. To the Botswana Media and Allied Workers Union, for Mau, Mr. Philemon Meso, your team and the photographers whom have told such beautiful and thought-provoking story for us this evening. This evening would not have been possible without you. It is through your work where stories are not only captured to write history, but reserved to empower others to rewrite history where there is need. Um, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, I thank you for your audience and may God bless you this evening. But before I go, um, Your Excellency, I have a gift here for you. Uh, this is a book called The Heritage Botswana. It's a story about Botswana and what's happening here from our friends at Heritage Branding and Communications. And you also find a bit about the Meningage work here as well. We have a box so you can share with uh, your team back in Pretoria. Hey. Uh, but just in closing, I just want to say that we can never ever overemphasize the value of this work. The work with men and boys is truly pivotal to ending a lot of social ills within our society, and in particular, the African narrative. Um, there is so much resistance, and I can tell you now, me speaking as a government employee currently, that um, these discussions are not there within the system. And it, we need to continue having these conversations whenever we can. We need to whisper to we, who we need to whisper to. We need to lobby as much as we can so that we can try and bring about some change. Um, I recently started using a tool called One Man Can. It's a tool um, developed by Songe in South Africa that was designed to um, empower men and boys on issues around HIV and violence. Um, it took me about three years to actually start having sessions at my workplace. And my point is that even today, I have different generations of people that I talk with, and I find that those in leadership tend to be quiet on these issues. So what that said to me is that um, there is resistance, and we need to have more of this conversation if we're going to change things because if the leadership in government does not see the value of this work then we are not going to go far um, i thank you all once more um, enjoy the rest of your evening right, uh, thanks so much Pizza, for for the for the thanks ladies and gentlemen i believe we've come to the end of today's programming thanks so much for being nice to